Association of American Physicians and Surgeons is very proud and honored to be a member of this coalition. We were founded back in 1943 to preserve private medicine where the physician is working for the patient and is following the oath of Hippocrates, which many, many people have forgotten, says, I promise to prescribe for the good of my patient according to my ability and judgment and never do harm to anyone. And my ability and judgment might not be the same as that of the American Academy of Pediatrics or, or the CDC. In the year 2000, we had a resolution that opposed vaccine mandates, which we still hold to. And because of this, we've been called a lot of things, anti-scientific, a fringe group, anti-vax quacks, anti-vaccination. Really, a lot of our members do give vaccines and do believe in vaccines, but we strongly believe in the right to give or to withhold informed consent for vaccination and everything else. So I'd like to discuss a little bit about evidence-based medicine, and there is a little handout on your, uh, that was on your seat. I'm sure you may have heard many times this statement, the plural of anecdotes is not evidence. Some person who fancies himself very clever made that up, and a lot of other people love to quote it over and over again. I would refer you to an article in our peer-reviewed journal by two other Millers, one of them Donald Miller, who is a cardiovascular surgeon in Seattle, and one Clifford Miller, who is an attorney practicing in London. And in their article about evidence in both legal and medical, they discuss the very famous Brides in the Bath case in England. It started out, a man married a wife, insured her life, and they were living happily ever after until one day she was found dead in the bath. What a tragedy. There was an investigation. There was no sign of foul play, so it was signed out as an accident. After he got over his grief, he married a second bride and the same story. Well, there again, there was no direct evidence of foul play, so since the plural of anecdotes is not evidence, and since bathtubs are very dangerous and people die in them all the time, you know, nothing much happened. But the third time, they really made a great change in the British rules of evidence and allowed the jury to find out about the first two cases after the third bride perished. And the man was convicted of murder, even though I don't know they ever figured out exactly how he made all three brides dead without any direct evidence. But we say now, the plural of anecdotes is not evidence, and we don't just have three cases of children, beautiful children who were developing normally and all of a sudden regressed after an MMR vaccine. We have tens of thousands of cases like that that have been reported, and we're supposed to ignore that. Uh, William Briggs, the author of the uh, book on uncertainty, the statistician to the stars, he likes to call himself, explained how sometimes anecdotes really are the best kind of evidence. I'd like to comment a little bit on, on a strategic error, or maybe a scientific error, that a lot of, of vaccine skeptics make, and that is they, they display this kind of chemophobia that they may learn from our own CDs, our own EPA, which will calculate how many tenths of an IQ point you may lose if you eat a paint chip that's got lead-based paint in it, but they seemingly are unconcerned you know, about things like injecting mercury. But, and then people go through this whole catalog of stuff that's in the vaccines, like formalin, which, by the way, your own body makes. And they, then they get all concerned about these little trace el things that are in the vaccine and about these demons on the periodic table, such as lead, mercury, and aluminum. It's sort of influenced by this poem I had to learn when I was in high school called A Shropshire Lad. It was about a king in the East where kings typically perished from being poisoned. And he fought against this. He said um, it was something that was kind of like vaccines, in a sense, that he gathered all that springs to birth from the many venomed earth. For first a little, thence to more, he sampled all her killing store. And then they did try to poison him. They put strychnine in his cup and shook to see him drink it up. But he didn't die. This is the tale that I, I tell the tale that I heard told Mithridates, he died old. So I think that if we get really focused on all of this concern about chemicals and how evil they are, and then the vaccine zealots 
will spend page after page after page refuting the things that you said about this. And it's really distracting attention from two things we really ought to be paying attention to, and that is the active ingredients in vaccines, the things that make them work. And these are adjuvants and the, the viruses that are the antigens that are in the vaccine. A friend of mine worked at the Salk with some researchers from the Salk Institute back in the 1970s, and they were trying to figure out a way how to give animals allergic um, myeloencephalitis, which is a model for MS and other autoimmune diseases. The way you produce this in an animal is you inject them with ground up brain tissue. A nasty thing to do to a guinea pig, but anyway, if you just do that, nothing much happens. But if you also inject an adjuvant, the animals all demyelinate their nervous system and die. An adjuvant is something that acts by a mechanism I don't think we're sure about, but it revs up the immune system. It stimulates the immune system to be, to, uh, well, to get immune or maybe, a, or it can do uh, allergic. Now, with the developing immune system, the immature immune system, the main task that the child has is learning to distinguish self from not self. And if you start to get immune to your own body, the results can be quite uh, devastating. But adjuvants are quite nonspecific. They just stimulate the immune system. Uh, the Freund's adjuvant that they used at, at the Salk Institute is an emuls emulsion of um, mineral oil and water, which doesn't sound too bad all by itself, although complete Freund's adjuvants has a ground up uh, tuberculosis bacteria in it that sounds a little worse. But just about all vaccines that are used today are adjuvanted because if they're not, they don't work. And for the main adjuvant used is alum, it's aluminum based, and aluminum can also have its own toxicity, but the main problem with them may just be this nonspecific immune response. You could get allergic to your own body or to something else, maybe peanut oil that's in the vaccine, maybe you ate a peanut butter sandwich, and maybe this has something to do with why we have so many kids carrying EpiPens around with them wherever they go. So we don't really know about that. Um, the little graph that's on, on your paper is, shows the days after immunization and the immune, res, immune title titer for something like egg albumin. And if you give that with just by itself, you get a little tiny blip in immunity that rapidly fades away. But if you give an adjuvant, it goes up um, and stays up. So alum is the most common adjuvant used now. Um, Thimerosal probably has an adjuvant effect also. So it could be that the adjuvant effect, rather than the mercury poisoning itself, although of course mercury is a neurotoxin, could have affected many children who got this type of vaccine. Well, the other thing that's in vaccines, of course, is the antigen, such as virus. And what are, might these viruses do? You know, of course, we, don't, we want the child to get immune to something like measles or something, but we don't want him to get sick. And it was like with smallpox, you don't you immunize them with smallpox virus, you use vaccinia, which is a relative to that. It has some of the same antigens, so you get immune to it, but you don't get sick or as sick, at least not ordinarily. Although if you try to get a smallpox vaccination today, they won't give it to you because it's too dangerous. And there were, there were years when actually more people died of the, po of the uh, smallpox vaccination than died of the pox. So the, the, well, what are these viruses in the vaccines actually doing? I read, can't, ran across an interesting case in the AMA morning rounds, you know, that we're all this concerned about autism and we've got to find some other explanation to, for it besides vaccines. They found that their risk of autism is twice as high if the mother had an outbreak of herpes simplex early in pregnancy. And they decided the fetus wasn't actually infected with herpes, but the mother's own immune response increased the a baby's risk of autism. We know that not only in fetal life, but after birth in the few, few, first few years of life, or maybe until mid-adolescence, the brain is still developing. The cells are proliferating madly. Many of them are dying back. Connections are being established. And if you disrupt the symphony at some critical state, the results can be disastrous. 
So this, this is one thing that vaccines could do, the immune response or the virus itself. Look at all the billions of dollars we're spending on Zika right now. We have, you know, a few dozen cases in the U.S. so far. Um, and, you know, in comparison with what we're doing to research autism, you know, we're doing autopsies in the kids, we're doing all kinds of studies to find out what it is that Zika does to the developing brain to cause microcephaly. Well, what is Zika? It is a cousin of dengue and chikungunya, which are tropical diseases that are much more severe and often deadly. Zika generally has not much in the way of symptoms, maybe not no symptoms at all, but can have this congenital defect. Kind of like rubella, a very mild illness. You might even know you have it, but if you get it in the right stage of pregnancy, it causes all kinds of congenital defects. And by the way, there have been at least one or two case reports of an unfortunate child who happened to catch natural measles and rubella at the same time and became autistic. But hey, that's an anecdote. And we used to call things like that a case report, a serendipitous finding that might lead to a real advance, but now I uh, don't care about that. Well, what are the viruses and vaccines? They are developed by atten you know, the attenuated viruses. They are passed through cell cultures until they become weak and they don't make you sick. You know, there's mutations. But as Dr. Goldman stated, mutations can work the other way too, which is the horror story we're hearing every year about influenza, that some mutated influenza virus is gonna come and kill us all. Also, remember that these vaccine, and so, well, some of the, the strains, measles vaccine strains, have been found in the cerebral spinal fluid or in the gut of children who were autistic. But we don't find it in everybody, so let's just forget about the ones where we did find it. So what can these vaccine strains do? I don't know. Um, what else is in the vaccines? Well, there are contaminants. If you look at cells on an electron microscope, you will see little things that they're viruses. Our cells are full of viruses. The vaccines are grown in cell cultures. These are not sterile. This is one reason why you have thimerosal in the vaccine, not because you might stick a sterile needle into the vial, but because you gotta kill off all the things that you don't want. So thimerosal-free vaccines are kind of like non-alcoholic beer. You brew the beer the same way and you remove the alcohol afterwards. And so that's why, um, you know, there may be a lot of things in vaccines like the SV40 virus contaminated the early, the early polio vaccine. Well, for, uh, there are some references for additional information. It's kind of hard, in my opinion, to apply evidence-based medicine to something like vaccines that I think involve a lot of black magic and even witchcraft to make them work because we understand them so poorly. I would suggest that if you are faced with the risk of, f of forcing vaccines on your children and you're afraid of it, look into homeschooling. Uh, that is a language that the legislators understand. <laughs> Less money going to the public school system, and I think there are worse things in the public schools than vaccine mandates, and that is teaching you to worship the CDC. So check out robinsoncurriculum.com, where it's about my children teach themselves to learn how to do it. Thank you so much for this opportunity.